Okay, you ready to have a little bit of fun? <clears throat> yeah? Let's have some fun. So, um, so I came up with this idea of doing this panel on hot takes. And the, before, yeah, hold on, get there. Before I forget, the um, case study from Informatica that I mentioned to you today, if you're interested in that, you, that code works uh, well. You can download it, it's available to everybody. I didn't get that on the table uh, this morning, but it's a really, really good case study. All right, a hot take. An opinion that's unpopular to the point of controversy. So, um, so we came up with some hot takes. And uh, every one of them is something that I have heard from either you or many of you or the research team, okay? So you were the source for these, all right? And what we're going to do for every hot take is we're going to put it up and we're going to start by saying, why is that in a sense true? Why do people feel that way? Why, you know, what, what, what supports that? And then we're going to go to the con. Well, you know, why is that maybe not so, so true and unfair? And just sort of have that discussion. And mm -hmm. we'll keep working through these. And at the end, if we have time here, um, you can submit hot takes. Things you would like us to talk about, and you can vote on them through Slido. Sound like fun? Okay. Oh, yeah. Now, I uh, wanted to swing for the fences here <laughs> on the first one. You ready? Sales is the most overrated, overpaid function in tech. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> wow! Exactly, it came from you. <laughs> yeah. No one has an opinion on that. Yeah, no one has no, an opinion. Apparently not. So, so I'm going to open up with you, Frosty. Okay. Because uh, you, you've carried a bag. You have spent a lot of time with sales folks from this community. You're starting a CRO council. So this is your world. But let's be honest. Why do people feel this way? What supports this? Well, first of all, I can't believe that. Services <laughs> executives think that sales is overrated and overhyped and overpaid. No. No, I say it ain't so. Look, I think it's because that's what you see us do in sales, right? You're seeing salespeople going out and, and doing kind of low value activities, right? We're running around taking first level calls when it should be support. And, and yeah, you see salespeople dealing with problems that they shouldn't be dealing with or dealing with little upsells or, or stuff that really could be handled by other people um, in a lot more efficient and a lot more effective way. So when that's what you see salespeople do and you don't see the hard stuff that they do, like going around and uh, you know, aligning multiple stakeholders in different geographies or dealing with complex RFPs or legal negotiations, you're going to have that opinion that it's overrated and overpaid. And, and I can understand why, especially if you don't see everything they do. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the things, too, you know, we talk about sales holding the company hostage. You know, JB uses this term in terms of transformation or change. Well, we can't do that this quarter because it, and, and you feel like, hey, you're slowing everybody up here. You know, you're, you're, you're flying the ointment. And, and Laura, I would definitely want to hear your perspective from the product side. Product people, I know, get incredibly frustrated with sales. What, what's driving well, that? Well, you know, if you look at every product roadmap, the two biggest influencers on the product roadmap, you would like to think it's data and it's customer success. And the two biggest influencers are what we call the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion, right, which is the executives, um, and sales. And, and particularly in these as a service models, we're still responding. We're still responding to sales to the new land motions. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I hear it as well uh, that you know that sales is uh, overpaid, overrated, and and the 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 product folks are trying to figure out how do I how do I contribute to that by making them more productive, basically, right? Being able to maybe deliver product qualified leads and shorten sales cycles and doing that, but ultimately bringing down that cost of sale overall, right, as a result. Well, yeah, it, it's funny, you know, I was, I, was, uh, I was asked in one of our board meetings yesterday, you know, what does, what does a healthy relationship between sales and product management look like? And my answer was, I have no idea. I've never been part of one. I've either been in companies uh, where product management just ran over sales like they were, you know, penny on a railroad track, and I've been in ones where that's sales the is the one that's you know, dictating. I, on this stage, right before COVID, JB stood up here and said the most dangerous thing you can have is field-built offers where you take a highly customized deal that sales did and <clears throat> turn it into an offer. And so, um, yeah, I, it, it's, it's a big thing, Laura. You're it's, right. It's, We've got to fix it. 
Well, I think maybe spoiler alert, because you and I have talked about putting a framework on the table, and maybe we'll tee that up for the next conference or in advance of that, mm -hmm. uh, where we can show how the, they, they can work better together. No. I, I, be, being yeah. the services guy, I, I got to weigh in. But, um, you know, I think one of the challenges, maybe the biggest challenge, is that salespeople are great at selling customers what they want. What they're not great at doing is selling people what they need. Being able to prescribe, understand business challenges, understand operational gaps, and then being able to sell the customer what they need and being able to defend that. So I think that's a real big challenge with a substantial portion of salespeople. And maybe that's the, sorry, maybe that's the source of the statement like we're just seeing here. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and I want to build on that and then I want to and get your thoughts here. Yeah. But I did the session earlier and I, I met an executive from um, Ernst Young and they're in the process of building more software uh, and you know, basically have more product revenues and they're selling that. And they have obviously their sales force, they're saying, hey, you know, you need to sell customer success with this. And that sales force sells basically labor, expertise all day long. They're like, yeah, no problem, right? And so we were having this conversation on how they have a, an engine that can stick the landing with every customer on customer success. And we have an engine and product that, oh my God, the customer will never pay for that. You can't sell that. And so I think that lends to this kind of frustration, right? It's like, if you can't sell the value, if you can't sell what they need, right? Why, you know, why are you so expensive? So Anne, let me talk about yeah. the tension between the partner channel and the direct channel. Sure, yeah, so it's interesting. So I'm a sales guide too. Yeah. I don't know if you know that, but I carried a bag back, I did the old IBM training back yeah. in the day. Yeah. So trying to figure out if I should feel offended by that statement. Yeah, well. Mm -hmm. Overrated, no paid, but <laughs> anyway. Um, but as we think about what happened with COVID, so whether they're vendor sellers or partner sellers, all of a sudden sales was turned on its head, right? No customer wanted to see a salesperson because they weren't in the office. No one was flying for business trips for a long time. Partner sellers also needed to think about, you know, they used to go to customers to do all of their work physically. All of a sudden, everything has changed. So I think this is part of the dilemma is the old school method mm -hmm. of sales, which is go around the building, meet new influencers, meet new buyers, build new relationships, go golfing. All of that just dried up with COVID. And so now there's a realization that we need to figure out a hybrid way to make sales effective, partner sellers as well as direct sellers. Yeah. And there's definitely, you know, there needs to be collaboration between the two, between partner sellers and direct sellers from a vendor yeah. side. And again, you're on this thread of there needs to be some transformation and sales is not very good at transformation to date. And I think that creates frustration. Now, we're gonna flip this on its head, right? L l let's make the case of why this is unfair. And please, not everybody don't jump in at once, okay? Because I know you've got a lot to say on this. But, but, but Steve, why? Let's well, no, Anne, Anne and I, like, we had this discussion. Like, we're both recovering salespeople, so we, we have a lot of empathy here. Um, look, guys, um, it depends. There's your standard consulting answer, right? It depends. If you have salespeople doing the low value activities, then yes, they are overrated and overpaid. And so you heard JB up here, everybody, talking about you've got to move those low value, low complexity sales related tasks off of the plate of sales and move them to different channels, customer success, partners, e-commerce, wherever you can, so that you can keep your salespeople focused on what they really need to do. Data, by the way, is a huge you know, tool to enable that. If you're not leveraging it, then, then again, it turns to be a relationship sale, and, and that's something we're trying to avoid, right, Ann? Right, and you know, I think that the issue to whether it's fair or unfair mm -hmm is I believe that old school sales did not use data to make decisions about what are the most productive customers that I could spend my time with. And um, I think in this morning's keynote where um, Ansar talked about the fact that at Informatica they have the data, the analytics, the AI to understand what are the most productive prospects yep. that are worth really putting the resources on because sales, it is a high, expense resource. Yep. And so if you can make sure that you're investing, you've segmented your customers really well based on opportunity, and then put those expensive sales resources in the right relationship models to focus on really gaining that value, but then maybe you can leverage other salespeople who don't have maybe all of that capability to move to that analytics somewhere else in the company, because really they have to use data to be more effective in what they do.
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you why I do think this is unfair, the statement, and that is um, sales is solving the com our complexity for us. And we, we've had this conversation in a couple sessions today. So we are difficult companies to work with. We've got a lot of, you know, chinks in, in terms of our processes, and sales plugs those with us. And, it's not, and sometimes it can make them very tactical. It ends up being a poor use of, of, of a lot of their cycles. And I think that the road forward is we become more data-driven as we migrate some of these, these commercials elsewhere. Sales can play that high-value role we need them, be way more strategic with these customers. And then I think this sentiment, sentiment goes away more, right? But, but sales, you have to le lean into that transformation. That's right. You have to absolutely. Can, okay. can I just say one more thing on that? So as, as hard as I am on sales people, um, I think the more onus is on product and offer management organizations to not just define the offer, but to define the defensible value yeah. within the offer and yep. educate the sales team on the value and teach them how to sell on value back yeah. to the point of view. Yeah. I think that's fair as well. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right. Next one. Um, enterprise data centers are done. Stick a fork in them. <laughs> so everybody out there that it's, you know, your bread and butter has been selling to on-prem data centers, right? And you're like, this cloud thing is still a fad. Don't worry, it's going away, right? Quite the contrary. Enterprise data centers are done. Stick a fork in them. I know you have a thought on this. Why do you think this is fair? Yeah, well, I think it's fair because it's undeniable that in the move to subscription that there's this massive movement to get the you-know-what out of the closet and get it up into a data center where there can be centralized management of it. However, we will live, as many people don't want to admit it, in a hybrid world probably indefinitely. So data centers will always exist, but they are shrinking. Uh, and companies are going to have to figure out how to manage that complexity on behalf of your customers, that hybrid model. So I, I think it's fair, um, but I think it's also not ever going away. I don't, I don't think they're done, but they're definitely going away. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, uh, you know, the exp I don't think that they're, like you, I don't think that they're done. Um, I think there's a lot of runway. There, there's inevitable stuff that needs to be um, not in the public cloud. Um, compute intense, compute intensive uh, activities uh, are always going to be, there's always going to be a role for that offline. Also, there's a very significant amount of cost associated with moving to the cloud. In fact, I think in the last few years, one of the top challenges around uh, managing for this um, in as a service businesses is how to manage that that cloud cost, that hosting cost from all the hyperscalers, right? And so we're gonna to live, to your point, we're gonna live in a hybrid world for quite a while as folks kind of figure that out. And um, as more workloads will move to the cloud for sure. But there's always gonna be a place for, for offline as well. Can I, can I piggyback one, one little point on that as well is I, I don't wanna give you guys the impression that having stuff on the customer's premises is a value proposition because I see a lot of organizations that haven't moved yet to the cloud and, and they feel their competitive advantage over the hyperscalers and cloud providers is, is, well, we're closer to the customer or for data integrity. I think the fact that AWS and Google and Microsoft can sell to the governments of every country around the world means they're pretty secure. Uh, and, but so, so don't put yourself in a situation where that's your primary value proposition is we've got edge covered better than anyone else or you know, you're always going to need those on-prem data centers. They're going to shrink. They'll always be around to some extent, but it's not a value prop. Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's directional, right? So the cloud is directional, but you know, there's always going to be that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So folks who are going to prioritize right, and leave certain things untouched and alone, is it right? We could argue whether it's right or whether it's wrong, but it may be a practical reality for, for, some, for some businesses. So, so, so you guys are arguing that you think there's, you know, there's life in these data centers. The only observation I'll make, and it's the point that you've made to me several times, is that for folks that are selling stuff on-prem, um, you know, they're fighting over that market share, and meanwhile, they don't 
they're not looking, they will take like storage, right? Like, hey, we're fighting over other storage market share. And it's like, oh, but by the way, do you see how much storage is moving off into the cloud over there anyway, right out of your market into that market? So I think there's still a little bit of denial there. Yeah, there's a lot of denial. I talk about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief for tech companies that are in <laughs> denial and bargaining mode and they're caught in that loop. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. If you look at market share reports that are out there, uh, you'll see two different types of market share reports for most tech sectors. There's traditional premises based and then there's cloud. The reality is, is most customers don't have a predisposition towards one or the other and it's a combined market share. There's one storage market. And if you look at the total combined picture, or compute, there's one compute market. If you look at the combined picture, it is undeniable that the cloud uh, is eating away every day at these premises-based providers. Yeah, well, and the other area of denial, and it's where you see it, Anne, is you know, with OEMs and their, and their partners that were making the money by dealing with everything on-prem, but is, that is, continues to shrink. There's yeah. no there there. Yeah. It's like, well, what do we do now? Yeah, the partners oh. need to create a new business model in yeah. order to deal with the shift because you're absolutely right. And especially when it comes to hardware. Yeah. That is the big nut to crack or fish to swallow, as yeah. we like to put it. So. So, so this may not be you know, completely true, but I actually believe that companies are better served if they over-rotate on this and, and say, well, what if this is true? <laughs> what if this is becoming more true, which it is? How are we you know, gonna operate differently? Um, here's the next one. Mm. Uh, enterprise SaaS will never be as profitable as on-premise software. Full stop. SaaS will never be as profitable as on-premise software. Oh, I disagree. What's that? I disagree. I think, I think it can happen, and we've seen examples where it has happened. So is it possible? Yes, we've seen that with you know, the likes of Adobe. and. I think we've seen it once. We've, yeah, but... Adobe. <laughs> I am serious. I, 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 for all these numbers, Adobe went from their old model on-prem to the cloud. They absolutely have better gross margins and profitability. Yeah. Who else? But we Who else? Well, okay, SaaS. If you, if you separate, if you include, maybe it's not XAAS, right? These are the platform providers are certainly, and the hyperscalers are demonstrating that they can make money, right? So if you have an embedded platform, that's one you get, can get revenue multiple but not as, there. They're not making as much money as an Oracle or an SAP they did back, SAP back in the day. 47 so, points. So we're talking about make money um, as profitable. So we're talking about 25 points of OI yeah. with 20% top line yeah. growth. So yeah, definitely slim pickings. Is it possible? We've seen maybe N of one. Can others replicate that? I personally don't believe that they can't. I think if it's been shown that it can be done, then there's a set of attributes associated that says you can do it. It's a question of, you know, do you have the... I mean, is, you know, is Adobe the black swan? I mean, the, the anomaly here, right? And, and I mean, I'm just looking at the data quarter after quarter. I just looked at Q3 snapshot for TSA Cloud 40. Uh, a stunning negative 13% yeah. OI. And it's getting worse, right? Right, worse than it was the previous quarter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, typically this is 30% on COGS, which means you have a 70% gross margin, but then you put all the other costs and you're, you know, you're underwater. Um, I mean, there has to be dramatic changes to that business model for it to get anywhere close to the 20, 30 yeah. points, you know, again, 47 in Oracle, you should throw off, you know, which, which uh, an enterprise software company, that's folks, if that's what we're from, that's the life we're used to live, right? So, we, so do you think, points. so what do you think, Thomas? Do you think it can get to consistent 10% OI maybe? I think it can what do get you think? To, yeah, that's a good question. I think there are going to be some exemplars who are going to, are going to hit that 20, 25 mark, but I think it's going to be the minority case. Yeah. I think for most people running SAS in this room, um, if you get to 10 points, you're, you're doing a pretty good job. Um, because to get to the 20, 25, you have to pull all the levers that JB talked about on day one. And everybody's heads are already reeling about, oh my God, can I even do like a third of those levers? So companies that pull all the levers, I, I, I'd take that bet they'll get there. I think that companies that don't, which would be a majority of the industry, 10 points is gonna look like victory. And I think everyone's gotta think about what is my, I mean, think about it. This is taking a huge haircut. That's right. And how much you're dealing. I mean, do you, I mean, any of the companies you're talking to that, that are running SaaS, do you think they're ready for the reality of a 10-point business model? No, no, they're not. They, look, I'll give you a hot take. Enterprise SaaS will never be as profitable as on-premise software. Yeah, 
doesn't matter. You got to do it anyway. Yeah. Okay. And what I see time and time again is uh, software companies are clinging to these old models thinking, well, I can't walk away from my traditional on-prem software. I don't have the same margins. Yeah. You're right. But they're going to walk away from you yeah. because that's not how they buy anymore. And that's not how they deploy anymore. So if you're going to be you know, addicted to those margins, okay, great. You can ride those margins right into oblivion. Um, we, yeah. you know, we, we call it swallowing the fish for a reason. And it's ugly, stinky, bony, and it's tough to choke down. And the financial model is one of the biggest issues. And I do tons of financial modeling for companies going on an as-a-service journey. And I will tell you right now, your CFO is going to be your best friend or your worst nightmare. And I was ready to jump out of my chair because I was going to say, fact. They feel that way because it's a fact. But I mean, there are some examples. And, and the reality is, is, so if you're on an as-a-service transformation, one of the most important papers for you to read, uh, and it's getting a little bit dated, maybe we need to update it, but it's Merging Economic Engines of Technology Providers. We talk about the four models of the subscription providers going forward. And the most profitable one is the one with the most services in it, focused and anchored on the most value directly tied to the customer's business outcomes. And these companies are doing upwards of about 28% OI. And focus on OI, do not focus on gross margin. It's a false positive for anybody in a services-oriented business. And, and the S in XAAS, it stands for service, and so you're building a service, and you have to monetize those services, you have to scale those services, you have to invest in those services, so that's a substantial portion of the fish that you have to swallow is on the service side, and, and like Laura will tell you, um, and how Stanley will tell you, it's defining and defending value in your offering. Yeah, and, I'll, and I'll, you know, I'll give you a little bit of an out here on the profitability side of it, so I was just looking at a slide in the previous session that I, had, I forgot it made of um, profitable SaaS companies out of Q3, and there are there are you know like four or five of them out of the 40 companies. Viva's one of them, and and I think they're sitting maybe around 20, 21 points, mm -hmm. right? And to your point, diversified economic engine. They're monetizing professional mm -hmm. services. They've got some managed stuff going on. It's not just so. I, I the big caveat here is if you want to get north of that 10 percent, if you want to be a product company just slinging technology in SaaS, I think you're lucky if you're 10 percent. I think if you want to the value and you diversify the economic engine, mm -hmm. then I think, yeah, that is going to give you the ability and the right to get to, you know, 20, 20 ish. Your, your value proposition is not how many features can I turn on and how many can I turn off? How high can I scale? How low can I scale? You know, can I move prem? Can I move hybrid? That is not your core value proposition going forward. It's getting closer to the business outcomes. It's playing the why game with your sales organization and your offer teams. Uh, we have five nines. Why is that important? We have six times. Why is that important? What is the business result of having that level of availability? Getting closer to the business customer. That's going to be what makes these businesses more and more profitable. Yeah, I agree. But I, I do think that there are a, a lot of CFOs, CEOs, that still have to get to the knot hole on the mm. reality of the difference of these economics. I can't tell you, and Laura, you and I have had this discussion, how many you know, offer teams, product leaders, I said, yeah, I'm being asked to sassify our portfolio. And the CFO told me, just make sure the margins are the same. <laughs> and then they're exactly. knocking on our door going, exactly. how do I get it? You know, it's just like that, did they understand the different profile here? So there's, some, there's a lot of, of learning on that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this next one, oh I put in here just for you. Are you ready? I was thinking, I'm ready. I was oh, thinking please. of you. The reseller model is dead. Just don't tell them yet. Yeah, this, they're listening. So you're hearing this from the members, so that's good because I've been talking about this. The paper that we wrote back, was that a year and a half ago or so on partner economic engines? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Around this whole point of moving from this traditional reseller motion of products and perpetual licenses into as a service for the resellers. Now, it's a totally fair point because they have to act like an agent, like a sales agent. So this whole notion of running a very large cash rich deal through your books and recognizing all that revenue because you were a reseller and you actually touched the physical hardware, the software, and you handled it through and integrated it and added all your great value add to it. And as a service, a seller that is a partner is acting like a real estate agent would selling my house. They don't ever own my house during the sales process, but they own that process from opportunity identification to a closed book deal. And they get paid a commission. 
and their recognition of revenue is on that commission. And so the business model for the partners now, back to the conversation you all just had about software companies, they need to diversify. They've got to build a new business model where they're really thinking about, all right, now we know that we need to actually build new capabilities. We need to find new annuity services offers that we can create that will complement our vendors that can create a new revenue engine around services, recurring services. Or we need to create um, potentially intellectual property that we can embed within the offer to verticalize it more specifically to sub-verticals and bring that differentiated value add. So, the, I mean, the cool thing is I'm getting an opportunity to speak with partners about this mm -hmm. at conferences, so able to really talk to them about how they need to step back, because we found in our data that the companies um, that are really creating this new strategy to deal with as a service are the ones that are going to be the most successful in the final analysis, versus trying to just sort of bolt it on to yeah. their current strategy. So, I mean, what I, especially if you put the word traditional in there, the traditional reseller model is dead. Right. I mean, I think that is a completely fair and accurate assertion. Mm -hmm. I think it's true. And I do think, and just watching, you know, you and all the conversations you're in in the industry, the the OEMs are like, this is like the secret that they just, they're like, you know, but just don't let them know my partners yet. <laughs> right. I don't know how they're going to make money anymore. Right. And, and mm -hmm. instead of leaning into it and saying, mm -hmm. well, I got to help them diversify right. Their economic engine. Yes. It, it, you know, look at somebody like CDW. If you look at them 10 years ago, they were cranking out their reseller. You know, you talk to those folks, those guys today, you, you look at their model. I did a, a podcast episode with Tom. I mean, they're, um, you know, they're incredibly diversified, their economic engine. That's how they're making it. Yeah. And, and, you know, this conversation, this handshake between products, mm -hmm. yeah, we have is, this all is, the time. <laughs> these guys are talking all the time because the poor channel folks are like, I don't know, we got this new as a service thing, and, right. and my partner's. The, whole, the model's dead with this. You know, how are they right. going to make money? Well, Product didn't think about that. Yeah, the offers yeah. aren't developed with partners in mind necessarily. So well, this is the thing Laura and I are like. We've been talking about this. So, so the data shows when, you know, when, when products are, product teams are soliciting input you know, as part of the product experience and the offer designs and their platforms and so forth, the data shows that they're you know, soliciting input from sales and success and support and, and all of these, and customers, of course. Um, they're soliciting input from the partner community at half the rate. Wow. Yeah. If and all. yet the whole partner community has got to adapt and transform themselves to these new as-a-service offers and platforms. And so the attributes that are in those technologies need to support the partner ecosystem or you know, whether you're first with a platform technology and then hopefully you can build on that and create a whole platform business model. Right. Um, but it starts with understanding how you're gonna play, how the product and the platform is gonna play with the ecosystem. And we're, for those that are transforming, that's, it feels like a bit of a blind spot actually. Right? Yeah. Anne and I have talked about this quite, yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, now this, this one again, this one I think is very, very true and people still haven't internalized it. I, I would, I would yeah. just say it's, it's, um, it's not dead, it's just way different. It's so different, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we're also seeing partners become managed service providers. So the interesting shape-shifting that's happening in the partner ecosystem is they realize they're not a one-trick pony anymore. They can't be if they want to survive, so they have to potentially acquire new professional services organizations, companies even, to add to their skill set or acquire or um, build a managed service so they can provide their own value-added services to customers. Um, and then their revenue picture becomes different because then they actually do take in the assets and then push out the services. Yeah, I mean, for OEMs, think about your partners. The most successful ones in the technology era, 2000 to 2020, were system integrators. Uh, they could take complex technologies and integrate them. The most successful partners of the future are service integrators that know how to build layers of value on top of these integrated service ecosystems. Yep. Uh, I'll tell a story because I see our, our two good friends here from CompuGen in the front row. And then we, are, we were just reminiscing. I was up in freezing Canada in February, like a decade ago, right, Marty? And to talk about how business models were changing and met with their CEO and CFO and you guys were pretty hardcore reseller. That was the big year. And there was this, this discussion of like, why would we ever want to leave that? Mm -hmm. It's scalable. Yep. We know, you know, this is not super labor intensive. And Marty's sitting there running professional services going, 
hello, I think maybe this is going to be important in the future, right? And the CEO, who's still, still the CEO, to his credit and that management team's credit, they have a very diversified you know, value proposition right now. And you would not be the company you are if you wouldn't have gone on that path. So kudos to you. But there's so many really, you know, companies that need to do that. And again, OEMs, I think you got to help with that journey. You just can't say, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Yeah. All right. This next one I put in here for you, Steve. I was thinking about you when I put this one. Ready? Okay. <laughs> Ready? Services will own the largest revenue number for the company. Get over it. Oh, you Sales, know. you got to get over it. <laughs> it. Services, not only do you have to get over it, you got to get with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like, I, it, yes. Yeah. It, it, when services are driving the economic engine, you're going to own the revenue. And, and, and you got you to gotta get comfortable with that. Seriously, because you are, you are the economic engine, which means it, this idea of kind of trusted advisor doing services things and not really being part of the economic or sales thrust um, is going by the wayside. And so um, we'll, we'll, it, it's more than fair. And it's, it's going to be you know, customer success, delivery, all of it. It's, it's really something that y'all got to get used to this. You are part of driving revenue now, big part. And sales is going to be there with you, but you can't just leave it to them to solve the problem. Yeah, I think it's a great statement. Services, you got to get with this. You yeah. got you to you embrace this. Because I think, I think this is definitely, I don't see a way out of this um, in terms of all the things we were talking about. On Monday, JB was talking about just getting you know, the cost right for this. But I think a lot of service organizations, there are still... Um, still lots of service organizations that are completely cost centers. And this philosophy of if I start to have commercial responsibility, the customer will no longer trust me. And I, I just, I, we know in the data that, that is just not the fact. You can own the commercials. Um, five years ago, I, I was meeting with one of the leaders of one of the largest hardware companies in the world. And they told me, we're a product company and we'll always be a product company. Services is something that our partners do. And so I said, okay, we'll see. And if you read every one of their 10 Qs and 10 Ks now, that is their leading line is X amount of revenue is now coming from subscription. And within subscription, X amount is now coming from services. That's their leading line. And so Steve's right, you, you have to get with it. it. So if you follow the TS50, as of right now, 62% of the revenue for the largest technology companies, some of the largest technology companies in the world, 62% of the revenue is services. So for the product companies that think they're gonna buck that trend and they're gonna hold tight and they're just gonna continue, it's, it's, uh, it's a walking dead proposition, so. Yeah. Yep, and again, I think the ownership of that revenue, more of that service revenue, the renewal, et cetera, is going to be right in that service organization, and, that, and that's going to be the gear. And I'll, I'll maybe yeah. just comment on, I mean, I spend a lot of time with, with product teams in the conversations, how do we, if we think about land, adopt, expand, renew, and the different teams that are engaging in that commercial cycle, how do you build layer-efficient solutions? How do you build layer-efficient experiences mm -hmm. in, from a product perspective? So, you know, it all kind of ultimately dovetails. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this next one is a topic that I, I did the executive advisory board on Monday. I just did the healthcare technology advisory board today, and we, we talked about this topic. So I'm going to weigh in on this one first, but here's the hot take. Employees are never coming back to the office on a regular schedule. <laughs> Never. So this is really fascinating. You know, I'll just kind of give you, you know, sort of a snapshot of everything that I heard, and we can, we can debate it. But um, it's very clear that you know, companies are certain companies that really do want to get employees back in the office on a schedule, ideally two to three days a week, and they're getting. And some are now crossing that line where they're starting to mandate that. That is happening. It's a minority practice, but that's starting to happen. Every company that I've heard who's doing that right now is getting a lot of pushback from employees. They're getting a lot of non-compliance, a lot of non-compliance. And, and we talked about one of the board meetings is employees, COVID has taught employees to ask one simple question about coming into the office. Why? <laughs> Why? I've been two years, I've been working productively at home here, and so I've got to commute now. Why? And so I think that if companies, if, if you're at a company, and, a, and by the way, there's a lot of reasons to be nervous about this, this virtual thing, and we talked about this, losing culture, 
higher attrition from employees that have never been in the office, collaboration. I mean, there are, there are some real concerns here that we have to navigate, right? And we, so we need some new playbooks, but we're going to have to create some compelling why, right, for em employees, because I think just, the, just because <laughs> I want to keep an eye on you or just because I think this is going to be a good thing um, is not going to be enough. So I'm curious, you know, what are you guys hearing from your members on this? Uh, I'll comment on it. I think, you know, I think what I what I hear and talking to to folks um, is that so much of this is influenced by the life stage that people are at, right? So younger folks, young single folks, and I hear this from my own son, who's you know in his in his mid twenties now and misses feels isolated, right? Feels isolated. Never work. He's been working for a company. He's never met anybody in person. It's yeah. been permanently remote, right? So folks definitely at that, in that younger single stages, you know, need that, I think, that social connection. But that's got to come from them as opposed to the company saying, you will show up. That's a whole different, that's a whole different oh, thing. I, I'd make them show up. Yeah, make them show up. I would. Up. I, I'm sorry. I'm like, oh, oh really? You're, you're, you don't want to come in. Okay, well, you know, we are entering a recession. So that's good. Look, <laughs> I say that, but let, let's have some empathy here. Talk about people in the, in the early stages of their career. Y'all ever been on a Zoom call with somebody who's kind of, you know, one of your entry level or early stage employees and maybe they didn't turn on their, their background in time? You ever seen they're working out of their kitchen? Yeah. Or they're working in their bedroom and they got three other roommates in the house? And you're telling me that's a productive work environment? It's not. Okay, so especially those early stage employees, there's the social development, there is the uh, skills development. I don't know how I would run and train an entry level salesperson if I had to do it virtually. There is that, that ability, especially early on in your career, to develop socially, develop your skills. I don't think you can do that virtually. But if no other reason, I think you got to pay attention to what does their work environment look like? Yeah. How can you be productive when you are in a one-bedroom apartment shared with someone else? It, it's, you know, those of us who have home offices, great. Maybe we can be that productive. Mm -hmm. I don't think they can. Yeah, yeah I couldn't no. agree more. I think that life stage is a huge thing. I mean, for those of us who are, you know, have homes and we have space and we can spread out and you know it's more convenient uh that's that's all great but yeah i, I totally agree and I, th I think this is a good conversation these are the exact conversations that were happening in the board on this because it is really a nuanced problem it's life stage is one of them right um again ma making sure that people are building um relationships you have flexibility though on the uh, on the other side um, so I, you know, my belief is that ultimately, like we're all just going to, we are going to develop a new best practice playbook here, because I, I, I do believe that this this hot take is true. I don't think there, we're not. Some companies may be able to get a recession. By the way, there's probably some CEOs that are like the one good thing if we have a recession, I'm going to get everybody's ass back in the office. <laughs> that's going to happen, right? That's going to happen. Yeah. But um, but I think that's going to be a minority, you know, play. I mean, I, have you heard anything to, you know specific from your members? On this, uh, you know, I, what I hear, and, and when I look in the audience, is is what I connect with is people. Human beings are social animals. We need interaction with other people, and you just can't make the connection over Zoom. I think you probably can be productive. Um, it's debatable how productive some people are, but I don't know about y'all, but I miss shaking hands and seeing people face to face. I think there's a collaboration that happens when two people can step away from the cubicle and step into uh, a little breakout room and talk through issues, plan together. So that's what I hear is we're, we're missing, we lost some of the social element. We mm -hmm. did see a spike in productivity. I think for a while people were more productive. In fact, they couldn't go out of their houses. They worked more. But now that that has passed, um, I think it's, it's more about social engagement. So that's, it's more of a, an opinion. Emotional. As you say that, I just want everybody to know, virtual, 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 yeah. virtual. We are a completely virtual research organization. I, I have something to add, and it's not quite about the employees, but I do agree about that demographic point. I think different demographics think that a flexible work environment or a hybrid work environment is very attractive to yeah being an employer or an employee of your company. So I definitely think that's true for certain yeah. demographics. But it's interesting because I've been working with a lot of you in the industrial automation space. Is that, and as I learn about partnerships and smart buildings and what you all have done to kind of 
deal with the whole COVID transition of having empty buildings or nearly empty buildings or partially empty buildings and how to um, really assure that you're not conditioning the air in all eight floors when you've only got 50 people in the building and how can they manage the energy consumption and it comes back to the cost of actually operating the, the building. And I, I think it's fascinating how our industry folks have really adapted their technology to meet the needs of this issue, which I do believe, I personally believe it will continue to be hybrid um, ongoing. Because we see a lot of large companies, large tech companies who are saying, we're gonna let people choose. And, and I think that's an interesting trend. Well, you know, I did a podcast episode with a, with a woman who specializes in, um, you know, uh, conservation energy, et cetera. And it reminds me of this data point, which is just interesting. So you think that the fact that, you know, everybody's staying home is really a good thing for the, the environment, which is what my assumption was. And she said, actually, it's problematic because our homes are not heated and cooled as yeah. efficiently as those buildings. Yeah. So we're burning a lot more energy being at home, even though we're not commuting. So, so it's not a huge a slam dunk for the environment that we're all home, which I, I, I thought it would be. Um, but I, again, I, I, I will assert, I, I think we, the genie, you know, is out of the bottle on this with, with employees. And, you know, pre-COVID, you know, there was the under foundational assumption was you can't have collaboration, you can't have productivity, you can't have all these things unless we're together. And it was a super minority c uh, case to have completely virtual companies. COVID blew that uh, out of the water, at least in the short term. And we, we talked about there's still some long-term things we have to navigate, but it, it, it reset expectations for employees on this. And I don't think they're going to easily, it's kicking and screaming <laughs> to go all the way back, I think. All right, next one, ready? Oh. Customer-centric is the newest square for corporate buzzword bingo. <laughs> you guys ever, raise your hand if you've ever played corporate buzzword bingo. Has anybody <laughs> ever played that? That's a great game, except if you're the speaker, <laughs> and you're talking, and somebody in the back row goes, bingo! <laughs> and you're like, what? Well, oh, shit. And so that's only happened to me once, just once, that's all. But it has happened. <laughs> anyway, I, he I heard this was customer -centric. corporate BS bingo. I don't, you know, where you stand up and go, yeah. BS. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, so what, what are you, and, and let's start from the product side and work our way, you know, down here. <laughs> what, what are you hearing in, in, in terms of, you know, what is customer centric from the product perspective? Well, this is, this is, this is such an interesting one, right? Because customer centric, everybody has, they either have their own completely a hundred different definitions of what that means, or they're inquiring. And I've had a lot of inquiries around, do you have a framework around customer centric that I can kind of use? And actually that was inspired my power hour this time because being customer centric means that you have you you want to deliver a kind an experience right that is that your customers want or that they anticipate or that they're going to like and so how do you how do you develop that and then how do you align on that internally within your organization um, and what's interesting when we I, I unfolded a series for those of you who are there you might you remember this I unfolded a series of of values and operating principles that ultimately we're all gonna to need to adopt if we really want to double down on being customer centric and create a core competency in this experience, digital customer or digital experience or experience led growth, right? And ultimately to get to a distinctive competency which is where we can competitively differentiate on that basis because that's kind of what we all want. Um, and ultimately, 60% said, no, we don't have any kind of alignment on, you know, core values like data over opinion and um, out, outcomes over outputs and, and so forth. Um, and, and about 40% said, I think we do, but I can't articulate them. So I think until we get that across product and a consistent view across product and services and sales and, and all of the customer engagement, all of the teams that engage with customers and deliver to customers, um, I think that's, uh, that's our challenge. Well, I mean, I, the heartburn I have with this term, right, and in, in, in why I say it's, you know, it, it, it's a corporate buzzword, is the simplest definition I've heard of customer-centric is, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that every decision that we make at this company, first thing is, it, is the, the customer's best interest in mind. Every decision we make 
You know, that's what we're, the customer centric means, right? We start there and, and, and then and we're not going to do anything if it's not in the customer's best interest. And I'm sorry, uh -huh. I call BS on that. Yeah, I, I, I totally yeah. agree. You know, because I think that there's our decisions that you make in a company, that you, you know, whether it's financial issues or this issue, that issue. Hey, man, I'm going to have to end the life this thing. It is what it is. That cus is customer centric. I'd say, oh, I can't do that. I mean, it's just to me, it's, it's an over rotation. Um, but having said that, I think there's some potential goodness, you know, in here. If we could get, you know, if we could guess get, I don't know, half of our decisions, you know, that really said, hey, they have to have the customer's interest, best interest in mind. And I don't see that you're on, Laura, how people are really operationalizing this. What does it really mean? Yeah, I would, well, if I talk about within product, if you get a lot of customer input right into the product, and you say, well, we got to respond to every single request that comes in, or otherwise we're not being customer centric. We need to give them everything that they want. Well, you can't possibly do that because every everybody knows that every roadmap decision is an exercise in how to twit, fit 20 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag. So there's choices to be made. The other thing that we realize is that when a customer asks for something, the, the question is to continue the, the layers of the five whys in a sense, right? To really kind of dig into what is really the root of the question or that, of what they're asking for. Because sometimes they'll say, Oh, if you just put the big blue button over on the upper right of the screen, that's going to solve all my problems. Okay, well, understanding why, listening and understanding, well, why do you want the big blue button? Well, it's because nobody can find the, you know, the, the reports uh, tab. Mm -hmm. And if you just put a big blue button there, everybody will see the reports tab. Well, then you start peeling that back further, that's a user experience problem. Right, and, and so now they're giving us, they're requesting a solution to the problem, no. what they think is the best solution to the problem, which may not always be the yeah. best solution to the problem. Yeah. So, and I think if you go back even further and think of innovation like Apple, Apple would say, hey, we designed experiences for problems users didn't even know they had. Yeah. Because yeah, right, we could envision a future. So I think it's that blend yeah. of listening, really listening to the customer, getting to the root of what they're asking for, and, and also being innovative in the process and being able to create experiences that ultimately are solving the problem for everybody, not just the one. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Hey, before, before um, we throw, finish this one off and throw up the next one, I want to give people a chance. If you want to weigh in, I don't think that's throw a slide up here. Um, if you have a hot take you'd like us to uh, debate here before we're done, um, do, they, do they need a link for this team? I don't know. Yeah. Or do you guys already have a link? I'm just looking at the app here. Do you guys, do you guys know how to submit? No, nobody knows how to submit. <laughs> hey, the Slido may not be customer centric. <laughs> What's that? Slido may not be customer centric. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. There we go. The, um, okay, so I, so. Oh, we're getting some. So you yeah. guys have been putting them in. Nice. Oh, awesome. I didn't see it. And you can vote them up, right? Can you vote them up? Yeah, I think you can vote them up. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I see those. So, so, okay. Yep. I so while we're them. waiting. Oh, here we go, here we go. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, I've got a point on this customer centric because yeah. to me, it's like those fashion trends that were in once, but they come back around. And when I hear this notion of customer centric, I think about the book Discipline of Market Leaders that I read a long, long time ago by Michael, I don't know if you pronounce his name, Tracy, T-R-E-A-C-Y. Um, but it was published in 1997. Mm -hmm. And he talked about the three potential strategies a company could have, one being focused on, you've got the best quality product. So you're very product centric. The second one is you're very operationally centric, cost centric, right. so you're driving the lowest cost model. And the third one is customer centric. Mm -hmm. I remember this very yeah. yeah, and so, you know, when I saw this as a buzzword, I thought, huh, it's like bell bottom pants are now flares. It's going <laughs> to come back around. So the question to what Laura is talking about is this really going to stick? And what does that actually mean? And will it really be ingrained in a culture of a company? And then a lot of members are talking about, how do we help partners to kind of stop talking about products and talk about outcomes and, and that being customer centric? So you have to really understand what does the customer actually really want and then sell in that manner. So I think of it more from the sales motion when I see customer centric 
and how do you change the sellers to be talking about outcomes? I want to just add one point to what Anne said because I think it's really important. She's talking about experiences. And so I, I use this analogy all the time. Who does a better job of engineering roller coasters? Is it Universal Studios or is it Disney? I mean, the answer is the technical roller coaster is better at Universal. Whose roller coaster do you have a better experience on? And that's Disney because they obsess over the customer experience. Mm -hmm. They know mm -hmm. the customer inside and out. So. Mm -hmm. so let me let me cherry pick a couple of these. These are some good ones that came in here. Um, and and this one, Steve, is for you. Okay. Sales will never embrace using data in any meaningful way. Well, never is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You no, know, sales is going to fight a kicking and screaming. We have all been taught that sales is art, not science. And we have been all been taught that it's relationship based and that salespeople are born, not made. And you've heard every one of those cliches. But I will, I will submit to you, if you will rewind back to the start of your careers, for those of you who are in your 40s or 50s, that it wasn't very long ago that marketing was the most fluffy, esoteric, non-goal oriented place in your entire company. And everything they did was you know, hard to track and impossible to prove the ROI. And I will challenge that right now your marketing organization is probably the most data centric group in your entire company. A good marketing organization knows exactly where every dollar is spent, where the conversions are happening, you know, which keywords work, which one don't. And if you're in sales and you think that's not coming for you, you're probably kidding yourselves. In fact, you are. Data and analytics can make sales so much more productive you can know when a customer is in jeopardy. You can know what customers uh, are, are working and why. And you can take that information and apply it back to doing smarter proposals and smarter prospecting. So yes, sales is going to push back on this because we've been taught that we're all like you know, Lone Ranger cowboys, um, but, but data is, is, is the only way forward in this, in this new way of doing well, it. Well, I, I, I think the marketing example and use case is, the, is, is a really good one. I mean, to your point, I mean, I think we've watched marketing go through that transformation, not all marketing departments, but a lot of them, because better data, better tools, et cetera. I think, I, I agree with you. I mean, I onboard the fact, I think sales will lean into data um, because that's how they're gonna be successful. That's how, you know, get the job done. So I, I, I think that that will happen. This one is for, for you, Laura. Customer success is a crutch for product management. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a crutch good one. plug whatever fills fills the yeah, gaps the glue. You know, I, so so where I see this one kind of play out within some companies is you hear so product is creating the product right and they're and they're creating the experience and then you and there's gaps in that in that experience right it's friction frictionful and so forth and. You hear sometimes this, well, we have a customer success team. They're going to work with the customer and, and, and you know, help the customer kind of close that value gap. Right? So the customer success team is there to do that. When, when I hear that, that's the kind of thing that I think of. A customer success is a crutch for product management, as in you're going to lean on them to solve that problem that if you're doing your, if the product teams are getting it right, they're really creating these frictionless experiences as much as absolute possible. What's interesting is I just had a conversation this morning with um, a company that has a large representation here with the head of uh, customer success and the head of product, and we were having a, a good conversation. And um, the head of customer success has t told me that one of the product leaders came into to the customer success team and was. And, and had an opening statement to the team and they were, they were invited in to speak. And they said, if I'm doing my job right, you guys don't exist, right? right. And, and so I said, oh, well, how did that go over? And she said, actually, it went over great because the customer success team took it on board that said, wow, the product team really gets it that they're trying to make the experiences as friction, frictionless as possible and that that's gonna make our lives easier in terms of working with customers and moving them to value faster, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's this crutch element is when product teams don't embrace that concept. Yeah, and I'll just, and I'll flip that one a little, because I agree with everything you said. I'll flip it a little bit. I have talked to companies where the product team, especially if they're doing, first time ever doing like a SaaS type offer, they're like, look, you know, we're just gonna just design this thing so well we don't need, why do we need customer success? It's just gonna be so easy to, you know, and that I think is a flawed. So I like the, they're like, hey, if I really get this right, 
I wouldn't need you, but I also am not stupid enough to think that I'm never going to need some service, you know, motion. So it's, I think it's getting it the right, the right mix there. But I think that arrogance is problematic in a product team if they think it's like, yeah, this thing's going to be so easy because have you ever seen a product that's right. so easy? That's right. that would, yeah, not too many. So I did a, a presentation a few conferences ago around closing the, the value and outcomes gap. And one of the questions um, that I had well, to the product teams was, what would you do if you didn't have a customer success team? We're like B2B enterprise company, in, as a service with re recurring revenue, what would you do if you didn't have a customer success team? Um, and uh, they, you know, you know, great answer is I designed these awesome frictionless experiences, but one of the options was panic. And panic <laughs> was the most voted for option. So I just thought that was... <laughs> So they need, you need yeah. the customer success yeah. team. And you know, you'll never get to having none, but I think if product teams are thinking, if I had a minimal team, how would I design the best possible experience and not use product customer success as a crutch for a poor experience? Yeah. So I'm gonna start this one with you and then go to you because you actually have data on this, but services cannot sell. <laughs> and we're you making know, some big bold claims up here about this, you know, services being important, but services, you, you have all these service delivery organizations, you know, that are part of, of your research domain there. Hey man, yeah, bad I news, mean, they can't sell. I, I would say um, that Jack Johnson would probably say he has substantial data to disprove the fact that services can't sell. Services can diagnose and services can educate, and that in itself is selling. I mean, the old saying that uh, helping will sell, but selling won't help. So I think services absolutely can, and the reality is, is uh, despite all their faults, the World Economic Forum said that in 10 years, you will not own anything, and you'll be happy. In other words, you'll subscribe to everything. Everything will be a service. And so it, it, it is proven, it's a proven fact that services can sell, that the expansion rates are higher, that renewals is a sales motion as well. So I think there's, there's irrefutable data that goes against that. I, I mean, I, I have a technician show up at my house, every, a service technician show up every six months to look at the air conditioner and the furnace, and they sit down and they write me a prescription. They say, you need this, and I write checks for sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, based on... That's a service technician. They are trained and they are sell there's no sale. I, hold on, this is gonna be $1,000. Let me get the salesperson on the phone here and walk you through it, because I don't know, you might not. I mean, the, in context, yeah. you know, helping will sell, selling won't help. And, and again, I, you have data as you look, look at this. I mean, I think, as, as you said, I think we, you know, we make these assertions because we have data that basically says, and the other question here, you do not compromise the trusted advisor status just because commercials are involved. That is a red herring. It, it, it has to happen. Yeah. This isn't a, boy, I'm, I'm scared of it happening. I, I challenge everyone, embrace it, don't run from it. Um, because you are the new economic engine, right? Your partners especially, right, Ann? I mean, the partners are going to be on their performing services, you know, in, in, improving your offerings, making them integrated with, with different solutions and vertical outcomes especially. Um, it's gotta happen. And I, I remember this, if you're in services, nobody understands services like you. I've heard ad nauseum, sales doesn't understand services. Well, you're right, we may not. So help them and be part of that. You know, make your services easier to sell. Make them more standardized, make them something that you can, make them something your partners can understand. So from, even from a product perspective, from an offer perspective, from a lead generation perspective, even from a closing non-complex opportunities perspective, you're the economic engine and you don't just get to off, you know, offshore that to sales. Can't do it. So man, there are so many good ones coming through here. I am bummed because we only have a minute left, but I, I, I got to take this one right here. CS is the new sales because it's cheaper. Mm. Mm. I would say two things. Number one, yes, that's a fact. That's a fact because the economics, but, but two, CS, we are talking, as JV talked about on Monday, complexity. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of complexity and there's going to be unbelievable hoops that have to be jumped through and navigate this customer. That's a sales motion. And as a, as a company, you pay a premium for that, as we should. If it's an existing customer, as JB was describing, who's, who's, you know, it's a very highly probable renewal, they're adopting, et cetera, and it literally is changing paper back and forth to update, to update the, the, the agreement, that's not a sales motion. And why in the hell would you pay the commission of a sales rate for that transaction? 
So, so I, I, say, I say yes and no to that one. We, yes, it's cheaper, but we have to get the economics there, but you're paying based on you know, complexity. That, that's the routing. We gotta get our heads around that. So we're, we have 38 seconds left. I had a lot of fun. Do you guys have fun with this? <laughs> do it again. We'll do it again next year. All right. Thanks so much for all the, the great sessions.